Over seven million different animals inhabit our planet. Really cool facts today. Oh, geckos are amazing. And, and we specifically are going to cover the Pacific gecko because this is a, a rare species from New Zealand. It, it's not even classified by the... What can they teach us? Do these things... They climb like Spider-Man. They, they, they go up walls. They hang on ceilings. They can get almost anywhere. And I was like, how do they do that? Many species are in crisis and need your help. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. Welcome to the All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris. And I'm Angie. Welcome back, Chris, I guess, because you're still on vacation, huh, Angie? Yes, I am in the great state of Michigan, pure Michigan. Uh, yeah, we did our traveling at a similar time. However, mm -hmm. yours was much further, much more adventurous, bit. and you're and you're yeah. back home now. Yeah, I did. I uh, I flew all the way to Australia. I did not have a chance to go to Tasmania. I was so close, Angie. I was in Melbourne, and I was just like, "It's it's right there. Tasmania is right there." And I just wanted to jump on a boat, a plane, anything. But my schedule didn't allow me this trip to uh, to make it there. But I was mostly in New Zealand for for what nine days, eight days. I was I was gone for quite a quite a bit, quite a bit. Well, welcome back. I know it's good to be back in the states. Always, always good, good to be back home. So, being that I was in New Zealand and my two best buddies, Rourke and Wyatt, begged me to do gecko. So we had to do gecko. I I told them we would do gecko right away, and it was on our list anyways. So what the heck? We moved it forward. Got back from New Zealand, and we're going to do a New Zealand gecko today. Yes, and I was ecstatic about this option because we finished up with a Komodo dragon a few weeks ago. And the more I learn about reptiles, I've always loved them. I used to mm -hmm. work with bearded dragons. I actually used to work with leopard geckos. And it's really fun to dive into the physiology. So thank you, Rourke and Wyatt. Uh, this is a great choice. And stick with us. You're going to have a lot of fun and hopefully learn a lot of really cool facts today. Oh, geckos are amazing. And, and we specifically are going to cover the Pacific gecko because this is a, a rare species from New Zealand. It, it's not even classified by the IUCN, but the New Zealand government or Department of Conservation is calling them a relict. And we're going to get into later what that means. But basically, they were endangered. They, they were down to critical few numbers on the mainland. Uh, we'll talk about their range today. But the, the good news is they are rebounding with a, with a solid conservation plan in place. So that's uh, a really, really cool story that we're going to be telling today. I love good conservation stories. When we, <laughs> yes. I don't love that we numbers get very low and then people have to step in and save them. But it does go to show that when resources and people work hard to save species, it can be done. It works. Mm -hmm. It works. It does work. And it is working. It is working. So I'm giving shout outs to people that are following us on Facebook and Instagram. And I put up a little riddle on who could actually guess what species we're covering. And I think it's Heidi or it's H lays me on Instagram. So I think her name is Heidi. I'm not sure. But anyways, correct us. Correct me if I'm wrong. Send me a message on Instagram. She's the only one that got Pacific Gecko. She's the only one. Now, there are some other people. Logan Millard, one of our good friends back there from Florida. He guessed the new Caledonian giant gecko, and my first clue was, if you were paying attention, I crossed this ocean, and it was the Pacific, so Pacific gecko there. Now, on Facebook, Vicky got it. Jonathan, our buddy up in British Columbia, got it. Uh, Ta uh, Tanya got it. Paul, well, Paul from Varmints, he didn't quite guess, but he said the clue gave it away. Ha, ha, ha. So he's, he, I think Paul knew it. Now, Joe Ricicci, my reptile expert, he said the Vorax gecko, and, and it's probably because the eye I had up there. And then Lori also uh, guessed gecko. So shout outs to them. <laughs> and then just really quickly, I've got to give a shout out to Kayla. Uh, she's the She does the Awakening Empire podcast. If I just want to promote her because her and I have been going back on Instagram a little bit. She... I, I, I highly recommend you follow her on Instagram. Every day she posts these little bits of wisdom and it just, I read it and it just like hits me in the heart. Like I just really think about what she writes and the quotes that she puts up. It's just one of those easy to read, quick hitting, wow, 
you know, and, and just, you know, how we tackle life because we all have problems. We're all facing multiple issues in our lives and it's nice to get some encouraging words. So, so if you want, you know, I recommend you, you subscribe to her podcast, the awakening empire, they're 30 minute episodes. They, they're easy to digest. And, you know, she's just amazing. Uh, amazing soul is how I would put it. You know, somebody on there. Now, the last thing I'll ask before we, we jump back into it is please share an episode or get a friend to subscribe to the podcast. If everybody listening did that, Angie, we'd be in the top 100 easy, easy in natural sciences. We jump like tomorrow. So this week, we're just asking you if you can share this episode. Do it, please. Yes. Get a friend to subscribe to the podcast. We will love you forever. And we're going to keep doing this. Yes. And and rate and review on iTunes or whatever those platforms are. That'd be great because we're almost to 100. When I last checked, I think we're like at 96 reviews. And, uh, and that would just be so cool to get more. So, Angie, my big question with geckos in – the listeners are going to want to hear this too, is how the heck do these things, they, they climb like Spider-Man. They, they, they go up walls, they hang on ceilings, they can get almost anywhere. And I was like, how do they do that? Like, you know, what is the physical process? So, so anyways, the listeners are going to want to hear that. We're going to get to it. But that was my big question going into this. That's a good one. It's it's pretty crazy. It has its own it has its own Wikipedia page. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's called Gecko Feet. Gecko Feet. There, it's it's insane. It's insane. Like, oh, I can't wait to get there. Okay, well, we will. We will. So, you know, this just looking at geckos in general, but you know, we'll get to the the Pacific gecko. This one's like a medium sized gecko which means it's only four inches long or almost 10 centimeters long, which is very big. You know, and that's a medium sized one. When we, you know, two weeks ago had the largest lizard on earth that's 10 feet long. Yes. We're definitely downsizing this week for sure. Yeah. But they're so cute man. geckos are so awesome. Uh, they're everywhere. So the Pacific gecko, this particular one, really cool color pattern. Olive green or brown, multiple markings. It has blotches, chevrons, stripes or bands. Uh, its eyes are brown. And then dorsal or underneath it, it's usually uniform tan. I guess I, I'd say it's almost a tan. Yeah. And then, definitely. yeah. And then they have those slender toes with extended pads, which we're going to get to the physiology of that, but how critical those pads are and what's on there to help them grip. It's, it's, it's insane. Their physiology is just amazing. Amazing. And a lot of the species of geckos are known for some of their brilliant colors or bright colors. And the Pacific gecko, although, like you said, it's more brown and tan in color, some individuals can have mustard yellow spots or blotches, especially across the nape of the neck area. And then it said some individuals may even have pink or orange shading. So just... Super cute, like you said, uh, with the different color. Right. And then these ones specifically, okay, so obviously they're from New Zealand, the Pacific Echo. And then they're on the North Island of New Zealand. So again, talking about geography, New Zealand is generally two large islands. You have the North Island, where I was uh, just a few days ago, and then the South Island. And then you have some small surrounding islands around that. Now, the Pacific Echo was specifically just on the North Island and the northern part of that, the northern half, where it's actually a little bit kind of warmer compared to some of the southern parts. Now today, and we're going to get to conservation because these things have suffered a lot uh, in the last 150 years, but they're doing really well in these, these island habitats that they've established for a lot of their species. And we're going to kind of talk about why New Zealand is such a unique and I've talked about this in many podcasts, how unique the biome is there, but they're in such a unique situation trying to preserve their native wildlife. They've established these refuges for a lot of their native species. So a lot of these Pacific geckos are actually thriving there while their numbers are still declining on the main North Island. So it's so an interesting, interesting story. Now, New Zealand, why it's unique again in this work, Angie, we're going back 60 episodes. Okay. So you say I always have the number. I think it was Kiwi was like episode 44, I believe, that we did it. If and you really know that number, <laughs> you impress me more than normal. You usually always impress me. But 
<laughs> yeah, don't ask me what episode 47 was. That was I was going to say, I'll take your word for it. I'm not fact checking that. Uh, no, that wasn't Blue Whale. It was something else. Anyways, the so going back to that episode, we kind of talked about New Zealand history and why it's so unique. Now, New Zealand was discovered by the Polynesians around 12, 1300, you know, uh, CE, common era. And they settled there. And that was the Maori. That's the Maori culture. That's a big part of New Zealand today. Now, the Europeans didn't discover New Zealand until the 1600s. James Cook came by in the 1700s and navigated both islands. And they actually, the Cook Strait separates north, the North and South Islands. And then when the British came and started settling New Zealand, got into a war with the Maori, and then they, they signed a treaty in 1840. But with the Europeans came all of these invasive species, and that is what New Zealand is battling today. And it just had a horrific impact on native wildlife. So we were talking about the Kiwi, Angie, with these flightless birds that had no natural predators. And all of a sudden you have dogs, possums, uh, weasels, stoats, rats, cats, all introduced. And they just devastated native wildlife, including the Pacific gecko. So that's, that's kind of where New Zealand is. Now, New Zealand has actually implemented a lot of policy to try to eradicate that. And we'll get to a little bit of this later when we get to the conservation status of this species. So New Zealand is doing something about it. You know, they're just not standing by letting their native wildlife die off. I mean, they're fighting hard for them. So kudos to them. Absolutely. Now, you know, thinking about, I love this part, you know, why care about a gecko? And gecko is a lizard, but it it's such a key piece, both as a predator and prey animal. You know, again, this is amphibians, reptiles. These things are so critical to the food web. Like, Angie, when you start thinking about these things going away, it really scares me. It really, really scares me. Right, Chris. The gecko's role is really important. They can act as a pollinator to native plants and disperse seeds when they eat fruit. We'll talk, of course, more about their diet uh, and, and a little bit later. But it's just incredible from a from an ecosystem's role without them i would not be good <laughs> no, no that's not very scientific yeah, but no. uh yeah i just a lot of times i think the little guys get forgotten about and mm-hmm. um but they're actually really important they're kind of like the middleman right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and which is why they were so devastated when you enter when those small carnivores or prey animals were introduced and to get rid of them completely or completely wipe them out would be horrific for the plant, for the other predators, for it's just, it was just, yeah, it's, I don't know. You're taking big um, cogs. I mean, big cogs out of the machine. I, I read some estimates. Oh, I like 20, that. Yeah. 20% of all lizard species will be extinct by 2080. 20%, one fifth of the world's lizard species will be extinct in 60 years. If we keep going down the track, we, we're going down. And climate change is a big driver of this. And I know, you know, we've hammered that multiple times. And again, that is what is affecting a lot of these species. It's just, you can't take these animals out of the food web and not expect to see impacts. And it's not just taking one species. You're talking hundreds and thousands and then tens of thousands. Oh, yeah. I mean, that that's... The numbers game is what makes it so scary. And yeah, so I mean, and if you're not into the ecosystem, I'm not sure why you're listening to this podcast, but if you're, if, if you're more of a, but another way to approach the gecko is to think about the economic importance, to think about the monetary value or the interest in humans from a research point of view. There's been several attempts to simulate the gecko's stickiness figuring out we're going to talk more about the physiology of how they actually do it and how their how their fingers or foot digit pads work more specifically but researchers want to know how to make that so they can make more uh, rigid polymers microfibers carbon nanotubes things like that and so Mm -hmm. from a engineering point of view they're quite fascinating as well Oh, yeah. And I was, you know, and we're going to get to the tail regrowth, but wound healing. 
Yes. You know, they're, they're finding out some the, the genetics behind that. Oh, yes, Chris. And I don't know if people aren't sleeping by the time we get there. I, I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole when it comes to the tail regrowth because Good. it's just Good. so fascinating. And I've had, I've had lizards drop their tail on me too. So it, mm-hmm. and it's such a mm-hmm. interesting, scary the first time it happens to you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna get there here really quick, right after, right after I talk about evolution. But it's it's amazing, Angie. They're they're amazing and creatures. If, if we didn't sell you on their ecosystem role as you know, pollinator, seed disperser, or a, a small prey animal, things like that, uh, just in or from a monetary or economical point of view, oh my gosh, they are just the cutest things. Mm -hmm. and they're using a lot of education programs so i'm sure most people have either seen them uh at a zoo handling program or a you know educational center or a friend's house right of course there's tons of geckos that are um kept as pets and Mm -hmm. they're just really cool uh and really 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 stinking cute yeah, yeah, I think people love them. They they really love them. The you know it, it's and these are animals that are ancient. Like, <laughs> wait, wait till you hear it. So really quick, I'm going to go through evolution quickly because I really covered reptiles well in the Komodo dragon episode a few weeks ago. If you don't mind him and- saying so himself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I love. He's you know, like, I, I knocked that one out of the park, guys. No, I'm just teasing. You did. You did a great job. Komodos was awesome. Yeah, yeah. We, we talked a lot about yeah, dinosaurs, right? You explained a lot about dinosaurs. Yeah, we did. We did. And reptiles evolved 320 million years ago before dinosaurs. And, you know, we talked about our dinosaurs reptiles. And technically, yes, they are according to the classification system. But in reality, they're not because dinosaurs were warm blooded, reptiles are cold blooded. But, you know, reptiles have been around for 320 million years. Now, the gecko, they, the oldest, this is so cool. The oldest gecko they found, they have found gecko parts in amber. So talking about dinosaurs, if we go back to Jurassic Park and how they claimed to make dinosaurs in that movie, they were using mosquitoes, right, that were trapped in amber and drawing mm-hmm. the blood out and taking the DNA and splicing it and doing all these things and making dinosaurs. Well, we actually have gecko parts that are preserved in amber from a hundred million years ago. That's so crazy. Yeah, I know. I know. So we know geckos have been around that long. And so they, they, they have evolved uh, and survived so much over a hundred million years. Now today there's over, I've saw numbers anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 species of geckos. So yeah, different, I, different I, I, I think I have 1,850. Um, yeah, I didn't I have time to the count middle. them all. No, no. <laughs> I'm on vacation, but it's not. I don't have that much time. Right, right, right. But yeah, there's a ton of them. I mean, there, there's a ton, and they're on every continent except Antarctica. Mm-hmm. So you know, our friends in Australia, over in Africa, Asia, we have them in, back home in Florida. Because, yeah, we don't have them in Michigan. You're right. There's not geckos that far north. But, Angie, there is a lizard. A lizard. Because I was I was thinking, like, reptiles, how far north could they go? How far south could they go? There is a lizard. It's called the viviparous lizard or Zutuca vivipara. And it's in Eurasia. And this thing ranges Norway, Sweden, Finland, and northern parts of Asia. Hmm. So, like, this yeah. lizard that's cold-blooded live in Northern Europe, but it does. It, it does. must so wear anyways. a ski jacket or some North Face pants or something. <laughs> well, we do in Michigan, uh, we don't have any geckos, and we've got a fair fair amount of snakes, but we do have a five-line skink, which I've never seen before, so I'm, I'll have to do more research on that. And then a six-lined race runner, but those are not in the gecko okay. family. Okay. So, yeah, so a few. Uh, and lots and lots of turtles. So the painted oh, turtles yeah. actually oh, yeah. are state reptiles. So yeah, yeah, yeah. There's good stuff up there. There's good stuff up there. But we have a lot of geckos in Florida. Yeah, I know. I know. I remember seeing them outside of my house. Now, of those up to two thousand species, there's five major subfamilies. Now, the Pacific gecko scientific name is Dactylus nemus pacificus, and 
the Diplodactylidae family has 137 species across Australia, New Zealand, and New Caledonia. So that's where these guys are, are from. Now, Angie, we did the biggest lizard, which was from Australia, of course. Now I'm going to go the smallest lizard. Oh, cute, How big. Cute, cute little How tiny, big? tiny. Oh, definitely fits in the palm of your hand. Oh, easy, okay. easy. Yeah, uh, easy. maybe a palm easy. of a baby's hand, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. So this thing is three quarters of an inch long or sixteen millimeters. Oh, precious. The smallest, the Jer Jerigua lizard from the Dominican Republic. And they basically described it as the size of a dime in the United States or a small coin with its tail wrapped around it. Wow. And so this was cool, though, with this one. So this is a result of island dwarfism, ah, which yes. again we covered in the Komodo dragon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because mm -hmm. they thought Komodo dragons were actually gigantism, which we talked about. But in actuality, science is actually kind of thinking they might have actually been dwarfed from their original size. To not, exor not exhaust resources. Sure. You know, just, so animals got not smaller. A lot, yeah, yeah, an island, sure. Yeah, so in, in the Dominican Republic, there's this tiny lizard less than an inch long or 16 millimeters. It's so cool. It's so Love cool. it. Oh. Yeah. Now, some cool facts about geckos and Pacific geckos in general. Where do we start? <laughs> I know. I know. In, this, this is what's surprising about this reptile. Lives 15 to 20 years in captivity. And we don't know in the wild, but I know the oldest gecko was 28, a leopard gecko, I believe. I, I looked it up. So that's pretty long for a tiny little animal. Oh, yeah, Chris, that's really long for a little animal, especially if you're thinking about getting one as a pet. You mm -hmm. might, want to reconsider, might want to reconsider, depending on your commitment levels. Uh, but I also read that in New Zealand, there's some fascinating stuff about the reproduction that's slightly different than a lot of other geckos, but they're very slow breeding in New Zealand and they've been shown to potentially live at least 42 years in the wild. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, that's a new. So I don't know if that's specifically the Pacifico uh, or just New Zealand geckos in general. So yeah, maybe if there's a, I'll have to have Rourke fact check that for me. Yeah, I will. Because it even, <laughs> my, jaw, my jaw hit the ground too when I read that. So, uh, yeah. So, very interesting. Well, it's just. I think it just goes to show we're just learning more about them. And Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's. Just be so, yeah, we're, we're science. It's, it's, you know, it's evolving and we're learning. So, There's yeah. still so much to discover in the natural world. It, and it's it's sad that a lot of it's disappearing. But. I know specifically with geckos and a lot of these uh, reptiles, there's so many of them that we haven't classified yet, you know, and Correct. yes, and you need a scientist or a team of scientists to study a few of them or a group of them. And they still are what less than 1% of the total population. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we, we still need to discover and, and hopefully we do um, so we can help them. Now, most geckos are nocturnal, right? So they, mm -hmm. they come out at night and, and that's when you see them. This was a cool factoid. I didn't, I, I didn't really uh, appreciate their night vision is 350 times better than ours. 350 times. So they basically see probably what it looks like for us during the day. I, I think for me, it's, they're probably like 360 times better. Cause my night vision is stinky. <laughs> <laughs> You walk and bump into the walls, right? Ugh. Pretty much, pretty much, yeah. So that no, but that, all jokes aside, that is incredible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're just fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. Well, Chris, too. I also wanted to ask the question when we were talking about geckos. What is the difference between a gecko and a skink? Mm -hmm. Because I've taken care of blue tongue skinks before and leopard geckos, but I never really asked myself why are they in this family versus that family. And it's pretty much just because the geckos cannot blink. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? I'm like, yeah. And they have, they, they have different skin uh, too, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit when uh, about geckos and how they shed their skin. But yeah, it's based a lot about on their eye anatomy or their lack thereof with the eyelid and that they can't blink. Mm -hmm. And that to me was a really fun, cool factoid. So I had to share it. 
Yeah, and they use they have to use their tongues to clean their eyes. Like that's how they get the the dust and debris out. So yeah. you always see them licking their eyes. It's just oh, it's fascinating. Now this was cool. They have hundreds of thousands hair like spines on their skin, which traps air. So that gives them like their water resistance. Water just rolls right off them. But yeah, it's really almost a little hard to describe unless you've held one or looked up close. But it doesn't really have scales like you think of maybe a skink or obviously a snake or some other type of of lizard but it has like macro scales or like you said these hair like protuberances that help it be water resistant and it almost to me it almost has a little bit depending on what what species of skink it is sometimes it'll it almost have to take on like a slightly translucent or slightly bulbous in character uh, definitely soft to the touch and not sticky or wet or icky for anybody who's never touched a gecko before. Uh, it's just, it's just really neat. And then I was reading too, as far as maybe from an interest in human or helping human biotechnology is gecko skin has also been observed to have antibacterial property and it can even kill gram negative bacteria. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, once again, I still think there's a lot that we're learning about it. and But just like other reptiles, like a snake or something, geckos will shed their skin at fairly regular intervals. Uh, and sometimes it can be a couple weeks to a month. And they basically detach their whole outer layer of these macro scales um, from their whole body. And for those of them that are under human care, a lot of times they're observed eating the skin mm-hmm. afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, like any reptile, the skin shedding is much more frequent when they're growing, right? Uh, but it still will continue and, uh, into adulthood. Right, 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 right. And still talking about skin per se, but, and I know you're itching to get to this and we'll do, you know, and we'll get to the, the climbing here in a minute, but how the tails break off, I think was a fascinating rabbit hole that I think we both ran down, right? Like (laughs) it's how in the heck. Oh, you mean, you mean my next three slides, Chris? (laughs) I'll set you up and then you hit it out of the park. I will just say it's called auto. Uh... auto So it's called autotomy, their survival mechanism. So when a predator's chasing them, they drop their tail and the, the thing, and I'll let you get to the physiology of it. I'll let you detail it because you probably have a lot more than, than I went uh, down. But the nerves still function in that tail. So it still like moves. It's so freaky when they drop their tail and it's like wiggling. So hopefully the predator will go eat that because the, 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 their tails actually serve as a fat deposits. You know, they, they deposit a lot of fat in the tail for body reserves. So, you know, it's a last ditch effort for them for survival. I mean, they don't want to do it but they will do it if it means they don't get killed or eaten, right? Yeah. I mean, you, I think you did a great job explaining it. Uh, just, I think in the industry, or we call it tail drop, but technically it is self-amputation. And as Chris pointed out, it's typically for a protective measure to distract, a distraction for a predator. Like, go eat this wiggling thing while I run off. But it happens uh, not just in lizards, but in other invertebrates. Uh, however, we'll focus on a gecko. And so in general, there's two types of caudal otomy. That's, that's a mouthful. Caudal, like tail, autonomy. There. Anyways, uh, when it's severed or when the tail separates, in the first form, it happens between the vertebrae and the tail. The tail breaks off. In the second form, there's several zones of weakness Mm -hmm. across each vertebra. And in the the second form, there's actually several planes of weakness or easily fractured planes across each vertebra or tailbone. And what will happen in this is the lizard will actually contract muscles to fracture the vertebra instead of the first form where it breaks in between. Jeez. Just, just nuts. Yeah. But these sphincter, but, but listen, because when it's happened, it's not like this bloody squirting mess mm-hmm. or anything mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. What happens is sphincter muscles in the tail 
will tighten or contract around the caudal artery to basically minimize bleeding. And so, I mean, it's, you know, the body knows what it's doing. It's just insane. And it's been recorded in about uh, 13 out of uh, 20 different families of lizards. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, of course, it's this anti-predator tactic, right? But, Chris, it's also really fascinating. Geckos will drop their tails when they're having fights or interactions with other conspecifics or other geckos. And researchers think that they'll do this because when the new tail grows back, it's not as perfect as it was before. So it's more club like. Mm. So it actually becomes like a better weapon later on (laughs) when they're fighting. That's crazy. Isn't that crazy? And now, but it's also, I think really important in my mind to mention that when a gecko does lose its tail, whether if it's doing it as an anti-predatory move or as some kind of way to be a better combat fighter, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. It, it's a great cost, a great yeah. cost. Because oh, yeah. as you mentioned before, a lot of geckos store fat deposits in there. So they're losing out on in stored energy and this cost can also affect their immune system. And so Although they can like drop their tails a lot, it's not just like they drop it once and it can never happen again. Uh, each time they do it, it pro- most likely does reduce their health and their lifespan. Mm-hmm. So it, it comes at a cost. Yeah. Yeah. But being smart little geckos that they are, in order to reduce some of the cost as far as losing these fat reserves, oftentimes they will come back and consume or eat their own tail. Yeah. <laughs> to get that fat back. Yeah. Mm-hmm, you get the nutrients mm-hmm. back. Yeah. Yeah. So just, gosh, darn, so fascinating. Well, and then just the regrowth process. I, you know, I looked a little bit at. Oh, uh, right. That's, this is slow. Oh, yeah. This is slide one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, snap. I, I was not yet. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got a little, I got, I got a little hung up in the actual physiology, the physiology of, like, of it. But I did. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, they're, they're cracking their own vertebral. <sighs> Bone. Yeah. That's just nuts. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not always. Sometimes they go between intervertebral mm-hmm. spaces, but yeah. So, but no, 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 you're, you're very, very right. Let me get, whoop, let me get back on track. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, yeah. but the, yeah, the tail physiology, the regrowth of it has of course been looked at re- researchers wanting to understand how you can regrow a body part. Obviously us humans, we can't. And if we could, it would be fantastic. Like a club for an arm or something. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah. Or but think about it for you know people that amputees of different limbs or even in general. But in general, researchers are super fascinated about it because what runs down the middle of your vertebral column? So your spinal cord. And yes, Chris, very good. So the spine, the spinal cord is made of nervous tissue which is something, of course, in humans, it proves to have very little capacity for regrowth. So scientists uh, recently, as 2017, have been trying to figure this out, and they know a lot more than they did, that basically, of course, there's stem cells involved, which we've talked a lot about on the podcast. And uh, Stem cells are those great cells that really haven't been pre-programmed into much of anything, so they to turn into a bone or a neuron or a muscle and their tails are loaded with them. But more importantly, they have a lot of this nervous tissue stem cells called radial glial cells. Mm-hmm. And so once the tail has come off, instead of forming scar tissue, like lots of collagen, which is what would happen to humans, these stem cells start forming And there's no scar tissue in the area of the tail, which is just amazing. And so with humans, with with us, the scar tissue is basically what ends up forming in place. And so researchers have interest in looking to see if these radial glial stem cells could be introduced into an area of injury and maybe stop scar tissue from forming and basically enhance stem cell development or regrowth into uh, the parts that are, you know, the parts that are needed, the neurons, the muscles, 
the bone, right? Mm -hmm. When the tail Mm -hmm. goes back, it has bone in it. So yeah, they're just, once again, it's at the very forefront and they haven't figured out all the answers and we're kind of still far away from using gecko stem cells to cure uh, spinal cord injuries in human. But understanding this process is half the battle, right? Right, right. I mean, I was reading, you know, they've just recently started mapping all the genes and there's 300 genes that turn on and it's a lot of the genes used in embryonic development or wound healing or even hormone signaling. And inflammation, right, of course. Right, So, you know, it's it's that as soon as that tail drops, the regener- re- regeneration begins. And yeah, I read somewhere it could take up to 60 days to regrow completely a new tail. But, yeah, it's just a fascinating process. Yeah. Well, the ones they've been studying it on the most is the common leopard gecko, mm-hmm. which is a house favorite. I know I got to work with them. They're just darling. Um, but, yeah, it can they their tail will regrow within a month. Yeah. Yeah, so it depends on species, species. Now I'm going to answer the, the, the question at the beginning here because we're talking physiology, and that's just the part where how in the heck do these things climb with ease? I mean, it's just, it, it, it's amazing. It's amazing. So looking at it, scientists, scientists know, so they've discovered this and, and really looked at it and, and how they do this. So the, the geckos on their pads of their feet have tiny microscopic hairs, and these hairs are called Cetes, and they have them all over their toes. Now, each individual hair splits even further into tiny microscopic bristles, like hundreds of them, hundreds of them. So they have all these hairs all over their toes that are all like bristles. And the interesting thing is they're not like uniform. They, they stick out at all different angles. So it's right. Not like, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's Angie, it's through physics how they do this. It's it's so insane. So it's just they don't have any sticky substance that makes them stick, like you would think. It's actually called the Van der Waals force. And these tiny bristles and hairs, they have such a large surface area and they're so microscopic that it's actually an electromagnetic pull of the electrons of what makes up those hairs. So you're talking getting down to the atomic structure of these hairs that allows them to stick to surfaces. And I think the only thing they can't stick to is Teflon. That's what I read. I I read that, that was pretty funny. Well, Chris, not only stick, but stick on command because it's, they can lift their foot up whenever they want to and then keep moving. Or yeah, they can and, and it, drop and they'll hang sometimes from just like one one foot. Yeah. It's it's physics. It's not yeah. it's not like Oh yeah, I was go- I was like Googling Vanderwall's for so yeah. snap. What's that again? Like Jeez Louise. It's the electrons. <laughs> it's the it's the, the electromagnetic yeah. pull of electrons is how these geckos can climb walls with no problem. And they can go like I read they can move so fast, like twenty body lengths per second. Sure, so sure. They just, do they it. Just yes. Zip along. So, yeah, to just, yeah, grab and release. And a recent study. <laughs> there you go. Van der Waals. Added to the, yeah. electric, well, you know science. So. It's, it's, it's just, it's Jedi mind tricks. I don't know. It's, it's cool. Physics, uh, like we yeah. said, you, you and I should have paid more attention in physics classes. Well, I know. I feel the same. That's uh, same thing with chemistry. If I had to go back and do it all over again, chemistry, biochem is obviously a little bit more near and dear to my heart. But mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah, I took a lot of physics and it was not helping when I was reading about this. <laughs> <laughs> but it did, but it did. A recent study, though, has um, also uh, suggested that the Van der Waals force is important, but there's also. Um, electrostatic interactions too that's caused by electrification forces yeah or capillary yeah, think- forces so not just not just them you know, the one type of force but there's many mm-hmm. there's a few other forces that i'm just not going to even try to describe on this podcast to save everybody and their brother <laughs> <laughs> yes. a favor but there's yeah, there's always something more right but just the fact sure that- sure yeah yeah it just keeps getting it keeps getting deeper and way more yeah. awesome Mm-hmm. But I just, I literally, I never, you know, cause I haven't studied reptiles and, and maybe Joe would have known or John would have known. But the fact that there's no 
you know, chemistry or some secretions down there that helps them stick at all. It's, it's none of that. It's, it's just pure physics. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. Which, right. Which once again, there's gotta be something either for engineering majors or biotechnology I people. That, I mean, there's something in there that uh, we can use to help humans out. I would imagine. Right. It's just right. so even, if, even if they could just make, Little shoes that we could climb walls with, like for real <laughs> Spider Man. <laughs> that would be awesome. Not for kids. Oh my God. Come home. No, totally walls. for adults. Yes, totally for adults. <laughs> so I could climb up the wall to get away from my kids. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Kind of not kidding. Right. Not kidding. Yeah. You had a full day with them. But, um, all right, so jumping in nutrition, really easy. You know, they, they eat invertebrates or insects, uh, you know, probably worms, things like that. Uh, nectar and honeydew. Is with right, the Pacific gecko specifically, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, well, and they will eat fruits, and yeah, and that's where we talked to them about them earlier in the podcast as far as, as far as being a seed disperser. So that I didn't really for me because of course when they're under human care, we uh, feed them mostly crickets and mealworms and things like that. So yeah, the nectar and the 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 fruits was a little bit new to me, but mm-hmm, mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm. why I love this podcast. Yeah, yeah, no, it's really cool. The, the, and, the, you know, again, that, that underlines their ecological importance. You know, they're out mm-hmm. there helping disperse seeds, plants. You talked about that one gecko. I think it's Marauders Island. It, it's the only pollinator of a specific shrub that, you know, if they go away, that shrub goes away. I mean, again, you know, talking about food webs. So what are some behaviors? Because, it's it, you know, kind of cool to think about what geckos do. They're nocturnal. That's when they go hunt and, and, and sure, eating. most are just to clarify, not every species, but in general, most, most are noct- nocturnal, uh, very few hunt during the day. But there are some standouts when you have a uh, you know 16 to 8 or when you have over 1800 different species of geckos, there's always some some uh outliers in there, right? Uh, but in general, mm-hmm. they are solitary. And um, they're a shy species. They're not going to approach you. Uh, they're and when they're either under human care or perhaps as a pet, they still can be shy, but they are not. You know, they don't typically mind being handled if they've been handled uh, since they've been little, or the caretaker working with them knows what they're doing. But they're also, you know, not maybe your most outgoing type of lizard, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think it, once again, anybody who's worked with lizards, and that's including myself, is they all have unique personalities. Some like certain things, some are shy to certain things, and it's just uh, can vary between animal to animal. But Chris, what I really want to talk about today is how geckos are super unique in the lizard family for the fact that they can do vocalizations, mm-hmm. and it differs from species to species. They can use clicking sounds, chirping sounds. They can use it in their social interactions like territorial, get get out of here, dude, or hey, lady, you're looking good, um, or when they're alarmed. Mm-hmm. So it's just really quite fascinating because this isn't, once again, seen in other lizards. Mm-hmm. And at this point, until there's some other PhD student out there changing the book, right now they're pretty much considered the only lizard that can make calls. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. And as I mentioned, sometimes it's chirps or clicks, but it can be squeaks or croaks or hissing, barking almost, if you will, depending on if it's mating season. They can they can fight over food and territory with these different noise sounds. And that's been known for a while. But a study in May of 2017 went ahead and wanted to try to understand the or dive deeper into the complexity of it. Because when we, the more we learn about bird calls, holy, holy cow, right? Or, mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. mammal calls. Oh my gosh, we think of like whale songs and uh, ay, ay, ay. And so researchers at the Max Planck Institute for Ornithology are trying to get down at the bottom of this. And they basically wanted to see if the calls followed kind of bird mammal complexity as an understanding and flexibility. So one of the things that makes some of these bird calls, which we need to, we need to do a bird, Chris. I was like, I'm, I'm itching. I'm itching to do another bird after this. <laughs> we will, we will very soon, very soon. Uh, uh, but yeah, just really thinking about uh, 
I don't want to use the word language, but when you talk about vocalizations um, and how birds can like adapt and be flexible, like, oh, it's really loud out because I'm by, you know, a busy highway. So I can increase the amplitude or decrease it or do it more, more reps to make sure they're hearing me. And so the sophistication is called the Lombard effect. Mm -hmm. And so, so researchers use the toke gecko, which is a really cool gecko, a uh, beautiful, beautiful species. Look it up if you're not familiar. Um, and what the researchers found was that the toke geckos did not necessarily increase the amplitude of their call when put to this challenge that birds and mammals will do. Instead, they actually produce more of uh, the loud gecko syllable. So the toke gecko actually, its vocalization is gecko which is amazing. It's, really, it's gecko. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's more like gecko. I don't know. I, oh, I, that's I'm crazy. Not too, yeah. So, but yeah, so they'll do fewer syllables. They will change up more of the syllable and sounds. And so the researchers are super excited because they are like, okay, it's not quite sophisticated and flexible and maybe um, complex if you will, but it is, still really re awesome and mm -hmm. they need to dive more into basically yeah uh, uh, the communication and how it's just proven to be so much more complex and like oh look at my my leopard geckos chirping isn't that cute mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. it's like there's a lot of when we talk about sentient beings and um and creatures uh which we of course talk about a lot this a lot on the podcast is so the summary of the story is geckos are awesome. They make vocalizations. And here, let me play just a little clip of a gecko chirping. That sounds like a little puppy. I know. So cute. Uh, but yes, and that's, once again, that's just the chirping. There's actually... Uh, I think it's the New Caledonia, uh, the big guy out of Australia. Some of the barking and hissing sounds that they make. Uh, I'll spare you guys the time on this podcast, but just incredible. I mean, it, it really unique from species to species. Right, And we're right, just right. starting to begin to understand why are they doing this or how they're able to be so dynamic with how they vocalize. Just cool stuff, Chris. It made me yeah, yeah. really fall, you know, I mean, my behavior and communication and just really made me fall in love even more with the geckos than I was before. So once again, thank you, Rourke and Wyatt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good, it's, uh, it's just, it is so complex. Like animal behavior, again, that could, I guess, it'd be its own podcast. It's just so amazing when you, you Ooh, cover these species. Do yeah. I, did I just hear a new great idea by you? <laughs> <laughs> like we can't even keep up with this one sometimes. Oh, I know. I I know. It's just in my brain. If I could I podcast know. all day long, if somebody would pay for Animal that, behavior. that would be amazing. Oh, they would just talk in, you know, 45 minutes to an hour about Oh, but behavior. I guess, yeah. So it's probably a good time. It's a good lead in to announce that I'm actually going to be teaching an animal, animal behavior class this oh. fall. Yay. So mm -hmm, yep. I got asked to do that. So nice. Uh, so I'll be learning more myself uh, yeah, with yeah. the students. So that'll be good. Yep. And then also an equine behavior, which will be super fun. That's yeah. No, be, that'd be fun. Yeah. That, that's really amazing that's your, fall for me. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. now repro, you said there, I mean, you sent me that video. It, I couldn't believe it. Like that was where I my know. jaw hit the ground. Well, and it's so funny because I knew because we were recording so late today, I knew you had a very busy day and you did not have time to, you had already done all your homework on geckos, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't care. I had to send you this video anyways. Cause I'm like, <laughs> I bet he doesn't know this. No, I, I don't. Uh, nope. uh, and I was like, and it's probably, I know he can't really respond to email or messages right now, but you did right away. I was like, Oh yeah, I knew he'd like that. <laughs> So what are Chris and I talking about? So in general, geckos give birth by laying eggs. That's not shocking. We've talked a lot before about other reptiles on this podcast. But in within this vast group of geckos, she can be pregnant for a short term or long term. Sometimes I read up to three or four years. Uh, once again, I didn't go by species by species. And I wasn't able to get any exact gestation um, dates for the Pacific gecko, but that gets us to the really cool stuff about geckos from New Zealand. And New Zealand has about 43 endemic species of geckos. 
that give live birth. That's insane. <laughs> and I watched a whole four minute video on it and I'm yes. not even kidding you. And I like, didn't even like turn my eyes away. <laughs> <laughs> reptiles, because you just always think reptiles lay eggs. That's just always been what we've understood about them. But now you have species of reptiles that actually do give birth live. Like that's crazy, crazy. A reptile, like nuts. All right, welcome back. We had some technical difficulties, and that's what happens when Angie and I are on the road just that time of year where we're both traveling. So welcome back, Angie. Thank you. Yes, I'm here. Uh, and uh, yes, we'll just consider that organic amateur hour geckos. <laughs> <laughs> it's like our first few episodes. <laughs> uh, well, hey, yeah. you, it's still, hey, the info's good and you still sound great. Okay. It, you know, it's, it's her, your, your mic's fixed now. We, you know, obviously Angie's in Michigan. I just got back from New Zealand. So we are a hot bear mess. with us. <laughs> Yeah, we are. <laughs> Just bear with us this week. I feel bad we for you to... editing this. Every five minutes, I'm like, uh. <laughs> so I'm just going to leave it in. The people, no, I'm just kidding. It, it, it will sound beautiful. And so we were talking about geckos giving live birth. Yes, some and of the you... most fascinating information. Yeah. We save some of the best, best for last. So, yeah, most geckos, of course, lay eggs, typical reptile style. And then the offspring are hatched and they're on their own. But in New Zealand, in the 43 endemic species of geckos that live on the islands there, will give live birth. And so um, sometimes one or two. And for instance, uh, the Pacific gecko will, uh, will give birth to one or two offspring once a year in late summer. That's cra it's crazy that they, they give live birth. Like just how they evolve that way why yeah. i know it's a different rabbit hole for a different right. day but really 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 cool and yeah if rourke and Wyatt wouldn't have recommended the pacific gecko i would never have no known no 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 so. if we didn't look at one in new zealand yeah that's that's amazing that's amazing that's amazing yeah mm -hmm. and this is where uh there's some some uh potential evidence that new zealand gecko certain Geckos in New Zealand can live very old and potentially 45 years, I read. But once I, I would have to fact check that, that was not out of a peer review piece of literature. So, well, uh, yeah, anybody out still, there doing research, let yeah, me know. They're still learning. I mean, they're really starting to learn, you know, the last couple decades, uh, you Correct. know, why they try yeah. to clean up what's happened there. Well, yeah. And then just, and just briefly with geckos, of course, their courtship rituals are going to vary dramatically from species to species. But it might include posturing movements. Of course, vocalizations are going to be a huge part of that. We touched on that. Sometimes nipping and nudging and or they've been known to uh, wave their tail. The male will wave his tail or scent mark. So lots of really cool behaviors that if anybody's uh, cared for geckos before or tried to breed them, it probably could have some uh, could school me on that and teach me a little bit more about their behavior. And parthenogenesis, which we, we touched on in Komodo dragon, has been reported in geckos. And once again, that's a female gecko reproducing without having acts, without mating, basically. Yeah, yeah. So, and we talked about that in Komodo and dragon. I don't, yeah. yeah, it's really crazy. Yeah, yeah. And two examples are the morning gecko and the Australian bino gecko. So, yeah. And then, of course, the little geckos, offspring, whether they're um, hatched from the egg or born live, they're on their own from day one, which of course uh, makes them very susceptible to uh, predators and to not living and things like that, which of course are some of the issues with the Pacific gecko on New Zealand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because IUCN doesn't have them on the radar. You know, obviously we, we talked about IUCN and they, you know, they have so many species to, to catalog. But New Zealand does, and New Zealand has them called, they call them a relict. They describe that as taxa that have undergone a documented decline within the last thousand years and now occupying around 20,000 mature individuals and their population stable, increasing at greater than 10%. So that's good news for the Pacific gecko and, and good news for New Zealand, what they're doing. But like I said earlier, on the main North Island, they're still in decline and they still have a lot of threats, you know, 
like we talked about all the different predators, habitat, you know, losing their habitat and destruction. I mean, that's that, that's happening as New Zealand grows. But on these barrier islands or these islands off the coast of New Zealand that are predator free, they're doing wonderfully. They're they're breeding and surviving just great. So that that's good news for this that's species. Aw- great yeah. news. Yeah. yeah. Now. Again, like I said in the beginning, and and going back to the Kiwi episode, New Zealand's trying really hard to become predator-free by 2050. And it is it's somewhat controversial down there because there's some Kiwis down there that believe it's it's just too late, let nature take its course. But I think the majority of the country is like, no, we need to save our native wildlife, which which I agree that they have to. So they're trying to eradicate all these introduced species. It's a very uphill climb. They're they're working hard, and we'll see. You know, we'll see if they do it. And I'll and I'll say, you know, flying into New Zealand, very tough biosecurity, very tough. They they're very very sensitive to what goes in the country because of all the introduced species. So you know, they're doing a good job, Angie. I mean, you got to give nod your head to you know Department of Conservation down there that's you know really trying to protect these these really unique animals. Absolutely. Absolutely, Chris. And I also want to give a shout out to the New Zealand Herpetological Society. They can be found on Facebook. They should actually be followed on Facebook, I would recommend, because you get to learn a lot of facts and about a lot of the hard work that they're doing to save uh, New Zealand reptiles. And they also have a lot of information on their website at www.reptiles.org.nz. Mm-hmm. So check them out, follow them on social media. You won't be disappointed and you'll hopefully get to see amazing pictures and learn about the great work that uh, they're doing down in New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. They're doing, they're doing really great. Now, Angie, a few weeks ago, I talked about helping reptiles in your garden and I was specifically talking about Julie's yard, like how we're going to go out and place things around to help lizards. So I found some other things that you can do to help, uh, you know, more tips on how to, attract lizards and help lizards survive in your own yards, wherever you are in the world, unless you live on Antarctica. I'm sorry, they're not down there, but it it was kind of cool. So some of the plants you can, you can grow or plant there. So the basic rule for lizards is you really want thick bushes and plants because that's really a safe habitat for them, especially from cats. You know, you have outdoor cats that like to eat lizards or try to try to eat lizards. So you want some thick ground cover, some vines or or dense plants that grow on the banks. If you can, you know, especially for like some geckos, like where you live, berries or nectar producing plant species are good. You know, certain shrubs that are native to your area are very, very good for lizards. Um, I've saw things like ferns are really good that, or other types of plants that attract insects, maybe not mosquitoes, you know, you, you don't want mosquitoes there, but you know, maybe some other bugs right. that they can, they can uh, eat. And if you just go to your local nursery and talk about what's native to your area of the world, say, Hey, you know, I want to plant some plants in my yard to help native wildlife. They should be able to point you in the right direction, you know, cause we really want to support, you know, our local habitats. And that's something we all can do. You know, it's, it's not just, you know, down in New Zealand or down in parts of Australia or, or far flung places for us that live here in the United States or like here in the United States for, for our listeners down in Australia. So plant things that are native to your area and, you mm-hmm. know, you'll attract native wildlife, you know, which is great. I guess if you don't live in Australia, you really don't want native wildlife in your backyard, do you? <laughs> It depends. It depends. But. We'll to, our, our Aussies down there will have to let us know. You know, I, I loved the few hours I was in Sydney and then in Melbourne. I'm coming back. I promise you, I am coming back. I, I love Australia. I know. Next time you have to take me with you. Yes, I, Angie. So on my bucket the list. The brief because I flew into Melbourne at, at dusk, and the brief landscape I saw because I was on the aisle seat. I was like, I wanted my face against the window, and I couldn't. Um, it, it just, it looked like the Aussie outback. Like you see in all the shows, you know, koala habitat, wow. kangaroo habitat. Oh, that's so cool. I was just like, Oh, I want to spend a few days around Melbourne and, and that part of Australia. I, I will get down there. I promise you, I will get down there, but Hey, thanks this week for, for putting up with our technical difficulties. <laughs> we're going to, 
With Angie's technical difficulties, yes. We're yes. going to record this week uh, for our Patreon listeners. So we have an amazing species safe for them. So check us out on Patreon. Thank you to our supporters. We love you. Um, we actually have to vote. I have to put up the, the poll. I'll put it up tomorrow on who gets money from uh, last month. And we have to send a check out to the organization that we're going to support. The Fox poll, I think, is done. So we'll throw up a new poll up there, too, for our Patreon listeners. But, But if you, you know... One thing you can do for us this week, share an episode on social media with your friends. Get one person or 10 people to subscribe. We will love you. We will love you. We will love you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Listen, learn, share. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com.